Hey, it's Emil. Emil Guillermo. Emil, a muck to you. We are here. It's it's New Year's Eve. This is our New Year's Eve show, and this is Emil Muck's Takeout. The micro talk show of the AAPI and the AAXs and the ALLs, all the rest of you. How are you? The, the, are you gearing up for New Year's Eve? We are celebrating. You know, our show, our show is on at 2 p.m. Pacific, live. We do it live. We do it live because it's dangerous. That's that's why we do it, right? But I'm told it's always New Year's somewhere, and we are counting down to New Year's Eve right now. This is the Lanyap. This is the something extra. We are counting down to New Year's Eve in Tel Aviv. I mean, that, that's the best we can. I'm sorry. We're doing that. A lot of Filipinos, actually, in Tel Aviv. You know, you see all the Filipinos on all the singing shows. And I got some dear friends in uh, all over Israel, not just in Tel Aviv, but around there, Haifa, around, you know. And it's... We're going to celebrate New Year's Eve because our show's on at 2 o'clock, 2 o'clock Pacific, but this is going to be a New Year's Eve show. We're going to talk about, we're going to talk about the significance of this day, the significance of New Year's Eve, the significance of a clean slate. In fact, you know, every New Year's Eve, we wait to see where is the new year baby where's the new year baby going to be born and you know no matter what you know no matter what town what region what state that's going to be the headline and this year as i say in my aldef column at aaldef.org blog the asian american legal defense and education fund i say to end 2021 and ring in 2022, DYI, do it yourself, be your own New Year's baby. And you, know, you see the baby picture there? I mean, it's for real. I, I mean this. Okay. I don't mean it literally. I mean, I know you've I know you, you you've given up the baby industry a long, many, many, many moons ago. I, I understand it. You, you're empty now. Yes, you've. You're, I'm not asking you to actually have a baby. Although, although that would be newsworthy. But it's newsworthy here. You know, first of all, you know, my, my New Year's resolution for 2022, six minutes and counting, by the way, New Year's Eve in Tel Aviv. Uh, my New Year's Eve resolution in 2022 to be negative to stay that way until the CDC figures things out and everyone gets access to not just an antigen rapid test, these things, which I, as I told you yesterday, are kind of, they're, they're good, but they're semi-bogus. You got to look at it as good, but it's sort of like a condom with a bunch of little holes. So not, you know, 100%, more like, 85 90 good enough for showing up at grandma's house as a hey, grandma hey, look 50 minutes of this i'm good but you could get some false positives and false negatives and you need one of those pcr tests the better tests so i'm gonna stay negative i'm gonna stay indoors I'm going to do this all throughout the world. I'm going to like celebrate New Year's because it's New Year somewhere. And as I said, after we celebrate New Year, at wherever you are, the good news, and it's always the very first story of the, of the year, no matter what town, state, region, the headline will be the announcement of the first baby of the year. And I say... This year, 2022, let's not wait. Let's just rebirth ourselves. We'll be our own baby. 
We deserve it, don't you think? After 2021, the twin towers of COVID, and now with Omicron, and it is Omicron from the Greek, not the Valley Girl. Not the Valley Girl. Oh my God. Oh my God. No. Omicron. Oh my God. No. Ah, Omicron. Now you can win a bar bet when you go on your mask free, safe Zoom cocktail party show. Just, you know, play the pronunciation game. You get a free drink. Incidentally, four minutes from New Year's Eve in Tel Aviv. Because, like, let's face it, we could all use a rebirthing, a new beginning right about now. And just look at it as the DIY New Year's baby. You. It's you. And just think about the baby perspective. The baby perspective. Fresh. Except for maybe the diaper part, right? But then, you know, what's a little poop after 2021? I mean, that was 2021. It was a poopy year. You know, you might be saying, come on, Emil, I know. I was with you until the diaper part. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, you know, reviewing the year, that's often a thing when you're a columnist. And I was going over all my posts, trying to pick out my favorite ones, trying to pick out the best stories. And I will have my guests come on momentarily, and we'll talk about the things that should concern us as we look past or we look at the past and review the year and talk about the things. I, I, I write about a number of stories that I think are, are, are significant. But the main thing is, this is the year that we hit 10,000 in terms of attacks on Asian Americans, according to the group Stop AAPI Hate. That's something. And now we're coming on to this new year. What are we going to do? The new year, 2022. It's also the 40th year after the single most important Asian American hate crime. The killing of Vincent Chin. We'll also get the trial of Robert Aaron Long who already has been found guilty of killing two Asian Americans in Cherokee County in Georgia, but not as hate crimes. The four remaining Asian Americans who were killed, those will be pursued as hate crimes by the Fulton County prosecutor. And that happens on April 19th. So what are we going to do? What's our opportunity We have to be reborn. We have to leave the past behind. We have to get rid of our anger and try to stake out something new for our community. That's a challenge of 2022. I'll talk more about that, but I'm looking at my clock and it's 11.59 in Tel Aviv. It's almost Happy New Year in Tel Aviv. It's 2 o'clock. It just happens that we do our show at 2 o'clock. It's New Year's in Tel Aviv. Happy New Year in Tel Aviv. Now, in Tel Aviv, where is the New Year baby? Hopefully, it's my friend over there, the, my Filipino friend over there. Uh, he's a little old to have a baby, but yeah. yeah. Happy New Year in Tel Aviv. We could do this all throughout. You just go throughout the world. It's already it's already uh, in Asia. It's six o'clock in, in Hong Kong. It, they've already so they're already celebrating. They're just waking up from uh, or maybe they're going to sleep now. In, in Tokyo at 7 a.m. Djibouti, it's 1 a.m. They're, they're an hour into it. Anyway. So if you're picking this up on the recording, you say, Emil, have you gone off the deep end? No, no, I haven't gone off the deep end. It's just like I wanted to celebrate, celebrate 
as we are on the show. And uh, I guess I can, well, streamers, gong. Happy New Year. In Tel Aviv, in Tel Aviv, where it's 12.01 to all my Jewish friends and the Filipinos in Tel Aviv. All right. Now back to this idea. The New Year's baby. See, here's the thing about the New Year's baby. The New Year's baby is for real. You know, we we rejoice when the New Year's baby comes because the New Year's baby says, it's fresh, it's new. But think of all those things that I mentioned. Think about Atlanta. Robert Aaron Long is going to go on trial in April. It's the 40th anniversary of Vincent Chin. We probably will reach a new milestone in terms of uh, instances of, you know, uh, hate crimes or not hate crimes, hate instances against Asian Americans. How do we deal with our anger and our rage as a community? See, if you're into my New Year's baby model it's simple we reborn we rebirth ourselves we come to this new year as babies and we grow we leave behind the past begin anew we transform and with that maybe if we can find that we can move our asian american community forward that's the hope that's the opportunity in 2022. Now, if you go back to my column last week in the Aldef blog, you know, I wrote about the family of Alex Ertula. Alex Ertula was the Boston College student about to graduate in 2019. But he had been in this two-year relationship with a young woman from South Korea who was going to school at BC was his girlfriend in young you and she was texting him hundreds that day in the total relationship the prosecution says there were tens of thousands of text messages that's how controlling this you know this relationship was and prosecutors said that she badgered him in young you badgered alex ortula to commit suicide in 2019 and just last week i talked about it the ortulas did something extraordinary and i thought it was just maybe a christmas gesture perfect for christmas they showed the love and forgiveness they showed a sense of radical compassion toward the ex-girlfriend and allowed her to plea to avoid possible prison time. The Atulas got more than they gave, though. Their act of forgiveness became an act of self-compassion and love that spared them further grief in the present, which is the only moment that counts now. And as I was writing my column, I realized that's just not good for Christmas. It's good as a New Year's wish. We have challenges in 2022. We have a past. We have baggage. And we can overcome them all with ease if we rebirth ourselves and ring in 2022 as a New Year's baby. We can make 2022 New Year's Eve one big maternity ward, wherever you are. Into Tel Aviv, 12.05 a.m. now, as I speak. Happy New Year to them and all their New Year babies. Because, you know, if you're born at 12.04 or 5, I don't know. It depends on how 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 uh, loaded the hospitals are with COVID patients. Patients, but you know, you know, there's got to be a New Year's baby in, in Israel right now, right? And all throughout the line, and at midnight tonight, wherever you are, do it yourself. DIY. Be your own 
New Year's Eve baby. We, we need that kind of freshness, that kind of newness to face a future clean, empty, without the pain, the baggage, the agony of the past. One way of looking at things, right? So, we continue our New Year's Eve show. Oh, quick news scan. You know, on the last day of the year, some people have died. Betty White didn't make it to 100 at 99. She's passed on. So, uh, R.I.P. Betty White. You know, she, having had a minor career in television, myself, in low-level local television, I know how hard it is to maintain and have that staying power. And Betty White, she just kept reinventing herself, kept putting herself out there. And she dies on New Year's Eve. So uh, before we celebrate, we let's remember Betty White. Let's also, if you're in the Bay Area, I, I need to mention a colleague of mine, a former colleague of mine in the ethnic media. Gail Berkeley, her father, Tom Berkeley, ran the Oakland Post, a newspaper that I find myself now contributing a column to. I did too when I was with New California Media and contributed some stuff to Gail and to Tom. Tom was the publisher, Gail was the editor. The Berkeleys, after Tom Berkeley's death, they sold the paper. It's now run by Paul Cobb, still out of Oakland. But Gail continued in the ethnic media. She started working for the Sun Reporter in San Francisco, another Another great legacy African-American newspaper run by uh, Amelia Ashley Ward. And I just was stunned when I found out this morning that Gail had passed on. 74, undisclosed illness. But she had an impact on Oakland. She had an impact on the, the black news media in California and throughout the nation through the Oakland Post, which was run by her father, who incidentally was a world-class sprinter at UCLA. I remember going up to him and talking about his background, a class guy, and that's why they got Tom Berkeley away in Oakland. So... You know, Gail went on to, after she sold the paper to the Sun Reporter, and the Sun Reporter is legendary African-American newspaper. It was the African-American newspaper in San Francisco for as long as I can remember. And so I, I, I honor Gail Berkeley. Pay my respects. You know, when you're in the in the media, when you're a journalist, you can go all sorts of ways, national, regional, but when you go ethnic, you go deep and you tell stories that often get ignored. You tell stories that really matter. I've often said that I'll compare all the stories I do, local, regional, when I was at NPR, anywhere. The ethnic stories I did when I was at the Asian Week, at the Inquirer.net, the things I do now at the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund, the things I do in the name of the Asian American community and the black, indigenous, people of color community, the broad BIPOC community, ultimately far away everything else. So... Essentially, what I'm saying is, Gail Berkeley, 
in journalism lived an exemplary life, telling the stories that needed to be told. So, I, like I said, I did not. Uh oh. Someone said sound. Now we have sound. Oh boy! Hi, Juanita. Juanita is on. Is one of our listeners, and she says, "Sound." And I think there's sound now. Let's see. Let's bring on Dan. Dan Gonzalez. Daniel Phil. Hello. Happy New Year's Eve. Happy New Year's Eve. Oh, some people said they've heard me all along. <laughs> yeah, I've heard you all along. Okay, good, good. And I, I don't, know. I don't regret a thing. <laughs> well, good, good. Well, I, I meant everything I said. Happy, happy New Year to our fro our friends in, and we have some common friends in Israel. Happy birthday to them, or happy New Year to them. And we also want to say, like I said, just remember those who pass. I mean, I think the Betty White news is was kind of striking. You know, because she's preparing, a, there's they're preparing a, some special that's on, uh, it's going to be somewhere, NBC, I think. And then, and then, like I said, I was just scrolling around. I see my, my friend Gail Berkeley dies. Um, she was at the Sun Reporter and she was instrumental at the, uh, at the Oakland Post. Anyway, it's tough when you see deaths, don't you think? Absolutely. Yeah. You never so, get used to it. Or at least yeah. I hope you don't. But this is the year when we did sort of, this is what made this year so terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, I can't, I can't imagine not being depressed to a substantial degree if you're paying attention to what's really happening. And, you know, I think even those people who uh, are deniers, right? Uh, the the people who believe that uh, everything from the uh, 2020 election all the way to uh, the uh, um, the COVID infections are a hoax, uh, even they are suffering, maybe even to a greater degree than than many of the rest of us from a true depression. Yeah. Well, you know, they have good reason because the the reports are saying that you have if you are a an unvaccinated denier, you have a 20% greater chance of getting, uh, yeah. getting COVID and ending up in the hospital. And maybe is, is it only 20% really? I, I thought you have a 20% greater chance. Mm -hmm. 20, oh, excuse me. Not 20%, a 20 times. Greater that, chance. That's much better. Yeah, big, big difference. Much better. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> huge, not, huge different. Yeah. Huge, 20, 20 not, is two zero. 20 no. times is two zero zero zero. That's that's a good one, Dan. Mark yes. is my strong suit. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. no, I mean, yeah, that 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 broke yesterday a, a report, and uh, what, yep. what what do you say? Uh, this is a time when well, they're be, they're beyond education. People say, "How do you deal with it?" And some people say, "Educate." No, uh, the people that are still in denial and refusal uh, yeah. are not educable. It's simple. Um, I'm, I, I have checked with a few nurses uh, in the past few days, and they're still being attacked by people that refuse to believe that they're suffering from COVID in whatever form. Yeah, uh, that, they're, that they're actually, some of them are actually being slapped or struck yeah, by people yeah. who they're assisting as they're lying in what could be their deathbeds in hospitals, taking up space that can't be occupied by other people with serious uh, problems, immediate problems. Yeah, that is that is a sad thing when you hear stories about how some of the the COVID patients are reacting to the people who are helping them. Yes. Right. And now mm -hmm. we're seeing uh, the medical, you know, the health worker community being, you know, really, uh, you know, they're being the, their numbers are. Uh, are being hurt by uh, by COVID, people not being able to show up to work. Um, yeah, some people are outright resigning too. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, this is a this is a dark time. I was reading something uh, from the Washington Post yesterday, um, 
where they're calling this really the public health crisis of our lifetimes, which really puts it up there in, I mean, not that it, I think sometimes people want to ignore it. They want to just, hey, I'm tired of this. Let's go on. You know, they, they want to just be, be done with this. Like they can snap their fingers and it's over. But this really is something of the magnet. When you, when people start talking about it, uh, you know, on the magnitude of this is the public health crisis of our lifetimes, it kind of hits you and you say, (laughs) this is, this is not, an occasional thing that's going to be over in a weekend. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's worried a horrible situation, particularly the U S. Um, I don't know that, uh, denialism has gone as far in, uh, other parts of the Western world, yeah. but, uh, it might be because of, uh, uh the abusive, uh, uh, media, um, that, you know, the people that are, hiding literally uh, behind First Amendment rights. Uh, and I'm, I'm really kind of confused by this. And I, I, I keep saying I'm going to consult with some of my friends that are, that are actual constitutional lawyers and who have argued cases before uh, the California and the U.S. Supreme Court. But most of them are not um, uh, free speech you know, experts. Uh, most of them are into employment law. Yeah. Uh, a little bit of criminal law, that kind of thing, but uh, and and it's, and also uh, civil rights, but uh, not criminal stuff. And yeah, I do not know, understand how these people can get on with what they're doing. And I and I can't believe that there aren't, there aren't more civil suits yeah. that have been filed against people uh, rather than individuals. The the whole of uh, Fox Network and OAN and Newsmax and all those offenders. Yeah, well, you know, Dan, the the whole idea of the First Amendment is it it, it it's used as a shield. It mm-hmm. is an absolute right. They can they they can say what they say, but they also need to uh, understand that they they leave themselves open to a deluge of information and fact, and you know, in the ensuing discourse from mm-hmm. people like ourselves who say you know who call BS on them. Who call you know? Who who say that they're wrong? They're flat out wrong. I mean, you saw that with the uh, with the go, let's go Brandon thing that happened. Uh, you know, yeah. where the guy claimed free speech rights and then later on appears on Steve Bannon's show to say, "Oh, the election definitely was one hundred percent stolen." So we we know that hey, this is the realm of free speech. You can say anything you want. Uh, you have an absolute right, but you have an also uh, you must face the the debate, the debate which will is sure to come because yeah. people will hear you and they will. They will uh, well, the, I have to correct you a, a little bit. Go uh, ahead. Go ahead. Good friend, Emil. It's not absolute. No right is absolute. All, all right. of all of them are limited. It's okay. debatable, Reg- regardless of how Republicans say, or and and gun enthusiasts, right, uh, it, say it, about the Second Amendment. All right, it's debatable, but all right, still, I say absolutely right, but that that is a debatable point. But my mm-hmm. when I maybe a poor choice of my saying uh, or describing the First Amendment, where I say you can say almost anything, almost you, anything. You, you can't say things that cause direct harm. You know the old uh, yelling fire in a crowded theater, and and I've seen instances. I mean, you know, we played with this in law school classrooms, right? And and sometimes in un- undergrad classrooms as well. You know, the guy takes out a Zippo lighter, you know, strikes it and says fire. Well, technically, he's telling the truth. You know, in a crowded theater, he's telling the truth. There is a fire. Okay, but does that make does that give him the shield of the First Amendment? And of course, the vast majority of people, if not everyone, are going to say, "Hell no, that's not right." Okay, because he's he's using a device to uh, get the protection of the First Amendment, but he's creating a greater harm. And so there's always this balancing, and that's why I cannot understand why, when you see how out of balance certain segments of the media are, the, the so-called news media, and how. Um, how, what the, the the depths of depravity that they've gone to, uh, in 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 engaging in falsehoods, 
uh, on a propagandistic level, right? I mean, what they're doing is outright propaganda. Well, you're it, right. You it know, the it has economic is- effect. I mean, some people uh, carry out violent acts, right? Yeah. That's been proven. That's well, been, the, you know. the problem is we leave the, the, the balance, the seeking of balance to the news consumer. And we've, we've almost yeah, sure. said, okay, you as the news producer, uh, you should have balance, but there's no balance. So we leave it up to the news, the news consumer to say, okay, I'm going to get this bad news from this outlet. I'm going to get this other news from this outlet. And you just hope that everyone gets the, the, the news they, they want to consume. Well, I see that. See, that's the problem with a lot of, um, I'm going to say liberals and so-called progressives people to the left of center is that, uh, they let, people on the right, particularly for, for at least the last 60 years, they let them get away with uh, uh, invective, that uh, very powerful invective. And they think that to check them, all you have to do is tell the truth. All you have to do is put the real facts out there and tell people, look, what these people say, are saying is falsehoods. Yeah. And, that, and as you say, you leave it to the consumer. Well, I've always felt from I'm a, I'm a child of the 60s, right, uh, and uh, and the early 70s. I have always felt that that's insufficient. That is an insufficient way to uh, carry on uh, the struggle against uh, propaganda, uh, especially uh, harmful propaganda that's intended to uh, maintain a certain position of power for certain groups of people. So, how would you do it? You do strict speech. Uh, no, uh, but you you do the you carry on the process of uh, making the argument here, that here here are truths here are facts okay, but you also go after them right in their face okay and point the finger right in their face and say you are a liar yeah you know how long did it take for the media to come around and call uh, the former president a liar. I, they said, well, that's a falsehood. I mean, they would do all this indirect. A lot of it was, though, Dan, a lot of it was protocol. A lot of it was, you know, well, see, every time every time the former president pushed the boundaries, you know, people, right, right. It, took a, it took a while for people to realize, uh-oh, we are playing under new rules. <laughs> we, are, we are in a new but, area here. But they only extended the protocol incrementally. Yeah. That's yeah, the problem. Well, you're right. You're right. But. You know, in the end, people started fact checking and, you know, at some point people started saying, like, we better do live fact checking of these uh, of these speeches, live fact checking of these. <laughs> yeah. conferences. And they because, didn't do it until the last year. Right. They didn't yeah. do it until the last year. You're, you're right. That, that was all incremental. And at some point you just have to say, hey, wait a minute, a lot call a lie a lie. It's not a, a, a perspective from a different view. It really is a mistruth. And so we, we, we are learning that in 2021, or it's all contributing to what made 2021 so bad. Right. Uh, 2020 was bad enough because that's when all the, uh, the scapegoating toward Asian Americans, yep. began, you know, and, you know, we got up to 10,000 uh, instances of, of hate uh, in 2021, mm-hmm. but, you know, I, you know, let's look back at the, and, I mean, and those are reported. Those are reported instances. Right. These yeah, are reported so. and some of them, but some of them are both reported instances. Uh, and at stop API hate, a lot of those are self-reported. Right. Uh, as opposed to those that so, some people have done studies where they say, this is what, uh, you know, was reported in newspapers. And this is, you know, uh, these were actual, uh, events or occurrences, but some people have called AAPI hate directly to report things because our community isn't as forthcoming, doesn't want to, yeah. doesn't want to, to come forward all the time. But I think that's changing, don't you? Uh, it may be, it may be changing for some communities. For certainly, you know, it's not all Asian Americans or Pacific Islanders either. I mean, there are certain groups. Uh, that have substantial minorities of people within uh, their population yeah. that uh, act like, uh, in almost every way, act like what are being called now the right-wing extremists, 
you know, people are starting to use that kind of terminology, and it's appropriate, right? Uh, uh, people are starting to make the comparisons. You know, the, 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 the late 60s and early 70s, left-wing extremists, radicals, right, were the people who were doing acts of violence. And then they say, and now it's all these people. And, and, and that's a false equivalence, okay? Because the left-wing perpetrators of violence were very, very small and isolated oh, yeah. groups, yeah. and and even uh, groups like the the weather the weathermen, you know, the weather underground and all that. Those those folks, 60s, yeah. yeah, they were they were acting. They were not blowing up people. They were, you know, they they probably blew more of themselves up than than anybody else. They were attacking things. They were attacking the objects of capitalism and, and of propagandistic communications. They were blowing up antenna. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not condoning this. I'm just saying you got to look at the difference between what their targets were and what the targets of the right-wing extremists are, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, the right-wing extremists, we, we, we have the anniversary coming up of January 6th. And you, you, there's, there's the news tape. There's a reportage that shows what they did, how many people died, how many people were hurt? And um, we know that that was, and hopefully we'll get to the bottom of it if the, the Congressional Committee can get yes. the, you know, the, the subpoenas honored or if, if the, the people who were, were subpoenaed show up and mm -hmm. actually testify. We, we, we need to see that in 2022. No, oh, yeah, no, they're going for it. At this point, they're going for it. And I have increasing confidence. I'm not going to get crazy yeah. <laughs> and say, yeah, they're going to get them. They, I have extreme, uh, uh, extremely hopeful yeah. situation, yeah, perspective yeah. right now. Well, look, I usually it's a columnist, um, it's an old columnist trope to say, do a year in review, hear all the stories that meant something. But uh, when you when you cover Asian Americans specifically, there is really only one story, right? It's it's Atlanta, and it's the, you know, the, really the awakening of everyone that we're here. I mean, you're a professor of, of Asian American history, Asian American studies, College of Ethnic Studies at San Francisco State. Were you surprised at the, the march, the reaction to the march killings when six Korean American were gunned down in those Atlanta spas? Because it seemed like the world just kind of discovered Asian Americans existed in some ways. Uh, no, I wasn't surprised by it at all. Uh, we, we get ignored, even though, I mean, it's kind of laughable. The laughable part of it is that we are almost overrepresented, uh, especially over the last two years, because there are so many Asian Americans that have been interviewed as experts. Yeah. Uh, in uh, especially in health, in in, in the medical field, uh, and a lot of them are South Asian. You're right. So you know, but, I, I, I'm at the point where I laugh every time they show a South Asian, particularly if it's a new face, right? Yeah. And and it's like, oh, okay. And a lot of them are from uh, California, right? right. They, well, they're, well, they, they, they're at UCLA. They're at U, UCSF. People get quoted all the time, and I'm not just talking about local news. I'm talking sure. about global. Global news, national news coverage, right? Well, so, so let me and they're Asian. Straight. Yeah, so let me get this straight. You're saying that because of that, I mean, that that is a, a concurrent thing, but you're saying yes. that lies the fact that people don't know we exist. Yes, exactly. It's, a, it's, a, it's an obvious internal contradiction, right? Um, there are a lot of people, you know, the same people who are, might be willing to attack us physically, right, uh, are the same people. They resent seeing all of us in the hospitals and uh, they resent that okay they they, they resent i okay I, i'll personalize this a little bit my wife for her entire working life was an x-ray technologist right and and at times she was a chief technician you know all that uh, she she has uh several times been accused of theft like right? you know by a well-known family very very large international engineering firm based here in San Francisco. You can kind of figure out who that is, right? Uh, and, and one of the members of that family 
was treated in uh, uh, in a, a hospital, a local hospital. I don't want to go too far because of HIPAA yeah. and all that. Right. Yes, but yeah. but uh, this person had lost a piece of jewelry, and she accused my wife. And they mm-hmm. later found the jewelry uh, on a gurney that this person was uh, moved around the hospital on. Uh, no apology or anything. Uh, at other times, and this occurred more frequently, white women have said, uh, is there someone else that can that can perform the examination on me? Because they didn't want to be touched or they didn't want to be told what to do yeah. by either a non-white man or particularly Asian or particularly a Filipino. Okay, and and many of these people are upper class and upper middle class, you know, because the the area <laughs> the area that my wife was working in uh, was Pacific Heights. Yeah. Okay. So you're saying that well, all throughout, this is what we can expect. It, it's yes, it's normal. And so yeah. when you see something like Atlanta happen, and you see people uh, reacting to Atlanta, no surprise, we're still invisible. Well, let, let me ask you a question. Didn't you feel I? Okay, did you all feel right. at all that people were kind of downplaying the fact that there were Asian victims? Oh, uh, you, you know, they they when they cited. People and they and they put people on the air whose relatives had been shot or killed. Uh, it's like they picked all around uh, the Asians. Uh, maybe they tried, and the Asians didn't want to. Uh, the you know the victims or victims' families didn't want to go on TV. But it, you know, it seemed like they were tiptoeing around the fact that there were several Asian victims. You know, it's, it's not. I think that they're tiptoeing. It's the fact that people are uncomfortable reporting on race in such an honest way. Okay. Okay. And, and I think I'll happens, buy that. I, I think, think what happens if you have Asian Americans who are, and this this boils down to, if you hire Asian Americans in the media and you you make them. Uh, and you put them in positions of power where they're deciding how the editorial yes, yes. Uh, positions are, are you know, how, how they are played out. And you have them in the field, you have them in the offices, you have them, you know, if you hire them, you will get coverage because they will, for the most part, uh, I would say they would be sensitive. They would know, they would know how to report uh, these issues that, in an all, a once formerly all white world, people would not know. They would be generic. They would not mm-hmm. want to mm-hmm. get into the fact that, you know, uh, six of the eight were Korean Americans. Oh, what a coincidence, mm-hmm. right? Uh, it's just, it's just <laughs> happening, you know, yeah. but, but this is, you, you put an Asian American covering that story and, you know, the lights are going off the bell. You know, I, I think, you would only find it among non-Asian reporters and editors if they, I, th- I think if, if they're honest, they would say they, they would not even mention it. It would just be like, oh, by the way, there were six, six of them, right? We're right. And moving. they'd give you the names yeah. and leave and, it up to you to figure out, you know. Right. And, and they would, and because there, there was a, a, a way of doing journalism where if you mention anyone's race, if you mention anyone's yeah. background, it was considered, well, why are you doing that? You don't have to. Well, we need to know that because those are important facts. Well, that's an irrelevant thing, you know, and and it and the debate is really on both sides. It's on the people who are woke and the people who are anti-woke, right? Mm-hmm. Because the woke people, some of the woke people would say, oh, do you have to mention race? Of course we have to mention race. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, like I said, I, I thought that if you had an Asian reporter they'll mention it and they, and I think because people are now a little more aware of diversity and more aware of that, you know, that these, not all victims are the same. They all have different stories. You will have people saying, well, you got to mention the Korean and just let it, just let it happen. But Mm -hmm. Asian American media folks being, you know, having our own ethnic media as well as being in the mainstream, we'll point it out. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Of journalism. Do you think that there may have been a little hesitancy to, uh, because of the fact that, uh, uh, well, the kind of businesses oh. that were attacked, and I, and uh, yeah. there's a there's another side, right, to that issue, 
uh, yeah. involving uh, Asians, particularly Asian uh, immigrant yeah. uh, who are who are involved in massage parlors and all. Well, it, the massage parlors. I mean, how? Yeah, it, this I I was curious about this because this is not exactly a um, you know it's not necessarily a wholesome business, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a hundred percent of the time. Right. And most of the time you have to say that, yes, it is until we have any kind of reason to believe otherwise, all that's happening is massage therapy. Right. Right. But we do know that there, there's an underside to this and mm -hmm. I don't think people began to really touch. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that wasn't a pun. No, underside, no, underside. Yeah, I don't do it. No, no, no pun there. But, but you know, but that. But you're right. I mean, at some point, people should look into. Well, who runs these things? I mean, mm -hmm. I was, I was in. I, I've driven in the South a lot. I had family there and was surprised at all the Asian massage parlors that that you know service truckers, and uh, you know, I just wondered about. You know how how are these how are all these uh, uh, these things related? Uh, that 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 takes another level of reporting, and mm -hmm. I don't think we ever really got to that part of the story. But it's 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 definitely there, um, and I, I I think at some point you know we may see more reporting digging into it when we get to the trial because Robert Aaron Long's trial is coming up. Uh, later on this year in April and people will be doing follow-ups and they'll wonder what about these spas and how is it a mm -hmm. hate crime and how are other, how are other Asian women impacted by, you know, by, by these, uh, you know, how, how are they involved in the, uh, the spa industry? And is it this, and a lot of questions about this. Oh industry. yeah. So, well, you know, uh, remember when uh, some States, started uh, passing laws that were specific to uh, the concept hate mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they were they were additive sentencing right so that if a person committed a murder and uh, it was found that they did so uh, with racial animus you know the technical term yeah. uh, with racial motivation that uh, you could add on uh, to their penalty so should they be convicted and so there are three five-year penalties, you know, extended uh, years in jail uh, for each for each uh, conviction, uh, for each crime. Uh, and uh, I I remember the resistance to that, and it was it was massive, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it and it was long-lasting. It, it it took place. The resistance took place over a period of about ten years, but it was very clear. I think you cited earlier. Uh, there was a, there was a, there were a group of crimes that were clearly racially motivated uh, against Asians uh, in the early '80s, and the most notable one that started it all off was the Chin case, the yeah. Vincent Chin case, and it, it became notable not only because of the victim and the way that he was killed, okay, but also. Dan, you froze. Well, Dan, I don't know what to do. You froze on me. Well, Dan, Dan Gonzalez has uh, frozen on us on New Year's. Can we, I don't know if we can unfreeze you, Dan. Oh, hold on a second, Dan. All right, let me, let me get rid of Dan for a second. I'll bring, be I'll bring Dan back on, but his, uh, he doesn't see. Okay, there we go. Hey, there you go. Are you, okay, you're better now. Uh, yeah. I don't know what happened. I gotta. I have to get out of. Uh, I'm in settings right now, and I need to go back to. Okay, chat is on. Okay, now are you? Are right, there? There, you got the signal. I see your signal. I see your bars. Your bars are up. Okay. Sir. Okay. All right. So, so yeah. Tell, tell me. So about, where was I? You were talking about Vincent Chin. Yeah, and yeah, and so, about. yeah, their motivation—they were—they were—they—they they were automobile factory workers, 
Okay, yeah. and their hatred was supposedly aimed at Japanese because uh, we got the Japanese imports. But, you know, there was more to it than that, right? Uh, the Americans were building big gas-guzzling cars, and so their market was going down. Uh, and the Germans and the Japanese were building uh, gasoline-sipping cars, right? They were much more fuel economic, economical, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, these men... Um, said, you know, Japan, they, they did the whole orientalization thing, right? It's, it's yeah. a generic, a generic chink or Jap, and yeah. they killed them. Yeah. Uh, and they spent only time uh, waiting for jail. Uh, I'm sorry, for waiting for trial uh, as their only penalty plus fines. Wait, wait, you're talking about the Chin murder? The Chin case, yes. Yeah, yeah. All right, we, 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 we they didn't serve any time. They, they didn't serve any. Well, well, it was for while they were awaiting trial. And, okay. they, got, and they got credit for, quote, time served, right? Yep. That, was the, that was the way it was handled. Uh, and so when you look at that situation, what was that, 82, right? I think it was 1982. Yeah, 82. 82. Uh, the, um, and then you compare that to the circumstances that have have confronted the entire world with police killings, particularly of African uh, Americans and Latinos and Latinx people, right? And and now Native Americans as well, you know. Uh, and and see, Asians should be understanding that racial hatred, racial animus, uh, can be aimed at us as well. And so, sure. I think, Wait, do you, do you not think that people believe that? Do you not think that people uh, think that racial animus uh, exists toward Asian Americans? I think that they pro they believe that it probably exists, but as long as they haven't seen the direct uh, impact of racial hatred uh, in their own lives, they think that it, they dismiss it as being uh, infrequent. Right? It's it's the, the probability of that happening to me uh, is very low, relatively speaking. And then right here in good old liberal progressive San Francisco, right, uh, there were several incidents of physical attacks, particularly on el elderly uh, Asians. And then people start thinking, well, they're, they're attacking the Chinese Americans or they're attacking the Vietnamese Americans. And then they attack a Filipino in Daly City, and all of a sudden it's, oh, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> okay, so it, once again, people uh, tend to identify the possibility, right, uh, if it has happened to someone that they can identify with. Right. Okay. Well, and so where are we Where are we now? I mean, we're, we're at ten, this number, 10,000, from Stop mm -hmm. API Hate. Mm -hmm. You know, they've collected this info. And we're going to have a trial coming up on April 19th. Mm -hmm. We're also going to have the 40th anniversary of the death of Vincent Chin. Mm -hmm. I write about that in, in my column. Mm -hmm. How is the community going to deal with this anger and, and rage? Are they going to, uh, are they going to rise to that level of anger? And uh, I don't know, are, are we going to see an, an Asian version of Black Lives Matter or are we going to be silent? Where, where do you think you, you've studied this as yeah. a, uh, you know, at the College of Ethnic Studies, yeah. you have students who've, who've studied this. Well, what do I you think, th think we go in, in 2022. I think you, 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 um, students down to the high school age. Okay. Uh, so, so obviously college students and high school students are mobilizing. They have been mobilizing, you know, um, when BLM started, uh, when it became uh, a phrase and it was initiated as a, as a real thing, uh, immediately there was an Asians for Black Lives um, group that was established here locally in San Francisco, and such groups were also established in other urban centers throughout the country. So that's always been there. They have been small in numbers, right? But they're very, very uh, adept at showing their uh, uh, willingness to act as allies on behalf of uh, BLM and African-American communities at large. 
Uh, and I think that, that the response to that from uh, black communities has been very positive. Um, on the other hand, uh, the attacks continue because there's a difference between the kind of people who are willing to do violence uh, for mostly petty things. I mean, it's not a petty thing when they do actual violence and kill somebody. But the pettiness is in the fact that they're attacking primarily because they are uh, Asian, you know, they're, 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 they're subhuman beings, right? And, and look at the pattern. They, they attack weak people, people who are least likely to be able to defend themselves. And that's the elderly, right? Uh, women, right? And, yeah. and so uh, sometimes not so elderly, but, but that's what's going on. And so you have the kind of people who are willing to do violence and you have the kind of people who have hatred or loathing, uh, but but they they don't want to do violence. But nonetheless, their attitude, right, is consistent with those who do do violence. Right? All right. So my but my question, Dan, is we're coming into 2022. We got the trial of Robert Aaron Long in Atlanta. We've got Vincent Chin's 40th anniversary yeah. uh, of his death. Are we going to see the community deal uh, with? these uh, occurrences or these events with anger and rage as a community or will we somehow I, I hope not I hope not anger and rage that you can you can be you can be well motivated by a little bit of uh, uh, as you put it anger um, I think I think but but building a, a movement okay out of anger uh, usually fails and it, and it usually fails quite early uh, what you have to have is a motivation that may have been initiated uh, with anger, but you have to think it out. You have to think about what the root causes of all this are. And just as we should be calling out uh, media and politicians who are telling outright lies, right, and pointing the finger right in your face and confronting them, the same thing should be done on a, at a group level, right, and that, and you've been involved in some of that, but unfortunately, it's uh, like the like the the Quinto case, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, the uh, that uh, you know police violence uh, can affect us as well. Now, the reason I see that as as somewhat limited is because, again, it's a reaction to a specific instance, right? And and once again rather than people understanding that this stuff is endemic, that these kinds of attitudes and behaviors are part of an overwhelmingly institutional problem, right? Uh, they just, they see this as an incident uh, that, that affected someone that they might identify with. So wait a minute, Dan, do you really think that it's just like instance by instance? It's not like that people don't see the big picture that this is happening to the entire community? Not unless we educate them about it. And the only, the reason I was looking at students and high school students is, uh, particularly at the college level, students have access to ethnic studies. So they can, they can, they can get educated in ethnic studies. So I'll, I'll, I'll put it to you. I mean, you've taught at the, at the same university I have, and, and you've taught at others as well, other colleges and universities as well. Uh, you've been a speaker at many, many, many more, uh, a panelist and all. Um, do, uh, do, do those students who are exposed to ethnic studies, right, um, is their influence something that you can see away from the College of Ethnic Studies? Away, do, do, do you see content involving issues uh, of race, right? Yeah, uh, in, I, I, in other classes, right? Unless uh, social uh, psych, etc. Yeah, unless people really, I mean, they they initially when they hear about our history and they hear about things in the context of how it's part of a racialized history, where of of anti Asian, you know, sentiment. I think sometimes it's a shock. I think yeah. when, when there it, you go, and when it occurs to them they try to in integrate it into their lives and say, you know, I've got this new filters on my glasses and I, I'm seeing life in a new way. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they, 
they don't usually get to the point of anger, but sometimes they do. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's enough to get to anger. Uh, and I think that uh, a lot of it has to do with access to, as you put it, ethnic studies, a, you know, Asian American history. And one of the things that's happening in California as of January 1st, new law is saying ethnic studies coming to the community college level, ethnic studies coming to the high school level. They, they, they've they got, you know, it, it begins the window where ethnic studies has to be, um, uh, you know, you know, presented to students and it becomes a requirement at, at the high school level. So I think that's a plus, but we're still a couple of years away from when, you know, it really takes full effect. The law right. actually goes into effect now, but they give them some time. They give school districts some time. And it's been challenged. It was challenged, right? Um, You know, there were some legal challenges. People actually filed lawsuits. Uh, And I think that's going to happen again. I think that that, uh, the kind of thing that you see uh, with regard to uh, anti-mask civil actions, right, are the same things that you're going to see. This brings us to the issue of CRT, right? Critical race theory. Theory, right. Yeah. Which is this, we're not talking, we're just talking about Asian American history. We're not That's talking right. about critical race theory. But, but, and I haven't, I have not tweeted this and I have not placed it on Facebook. I haven't done anything there for several months. Uh, I'm so disgusted with the, with the, with the media and their, their failure to police themselves properly. But, um, so what if they call it CRT and it hasn't been taught at the K through 12? People keep saying that, right? That's the, the, it's not taught. It's not taught. So you guys are lying and you're using this as a device to get people to vote for more Republicans. And, uh, you know, so that gubernatorial candidates put their more than their foot in their mouth, you know, uh, and, and don't know how to deal with this. And they pick up CRT and simply say, it's not there. It's not being taught. It, you know, that position is really stupid, okay? And I'll tell you why. Okay, good. Because the content of ethnic studies, right, is exactly the thing that these people are really against. So when you say CRT doesn't exist, it's a boogeyman, and it doesn't exist K through 12. The reality is that the people who use CRT as a label against this bad thing, right, are really talking about Ethnic studies content. Of course, yeah. They, they're just talking about the, you know, the thing is, what, I want to embrace ethnic studies because sure. in my day, when I was growing up, people would downplay the ethnic studies and they'd say, oh, you're studying basket weaving. Why would you want to study basket weaving, right? <laughs> and so unimportant, so irrelevant to your life. It turns out to be the most relevant thing in our lives. And right. so I want to embrace the fact that these laws are there. But you're right. You're right. People confusing critical race theory with ethnic studies and using it to uh, to put it down. The fact is, you know, whatever they 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 uh, use as a term, they don't like ethnic studies. That's right. They just Tucson, like- Tucson. Yeah. Passed the ordinance. Right. And it was upheld in for in majority uh as the, the by the uh, ninth circuit it, in it, Arizona. Didn't, it didn't go to the u.s supreme court but the oh. the so-called liberal right the the hated yeah. the ninth circuit uh allowed the ordinance to stand uh and to be clear it was about it wasn't about ethnic studies in general it was particularly about mexican american studies yeah. and well and, i mean uh, they're they're part of I mean, they should be yeah of, they are in Tucson, especially right. in Tucson. well look this is the thing about uh what the battles that we have ahead yes um there it is know, like i said uh, I mean, asian americans have all sorts of issues not just you know the atlanta not right. just the chin's 40th which is coming up but and not just not just racial hatred not, uh, well you know. Not just racial, but, you know, a lot of it goes back to racial hatred. So one of my sure. columns, I talk about how people, if you are going to slur an Asian American, I talk about how uh, how how people should apologize. I, oh, I yeah, that, that's model, a good, that was a good one. Yeah, I read that, a, yeah. A model apology for the model minority. I mean, and you have to really, you know, not say, oh, I'm sorry if you feel hurt or I'm sorry if you're offended, 
you, you should just say outright that I, I, you know, that you have uh, said something that is racist and slurs not just the Asian Americans, but is mm -hmm. a really a uh, uh, it's a negative to all of humanity. You know, by by targeting Asian Americans, that's the kind of apology that people should give. Right. A model, right. model apology, and then and then I I also point out the fact that in baseball, Shohei Otani. Who's mm -hmm. Asian in America, a little different from an Asian American, but maybe he'll he'll stay in America and become a citizen. Now. But but he was the best player in baseball, and he was attacked yeah. by people who said, "Oh, oh, it's really a, a bad sign in baseball when your best player is Asian." <laughs> <laughs> this is what Stephen A. Smith, who's Mr. Fourteen Million Dollar Man at in, at ESPN, said. So. Um, you know, I, I had my uh, my fun. People can go to my column today and they get the link there. So th I those, thought that was really good. Yeah, those are those are issues that that I that I have. You know, the Sunni Lee is the most. Uh, you know, she's I think really the most famous and most watchable Asian American because she won, you know, the gold medal uh, over. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. there was another uh, Chloe. Yeah, Chloe, Chloe Kim, right? Yeah. Chloe Kim. Well, she won. She won in at the Winter Olympics. That's and right. She, she's coming back now, but right. uh, you know, Chloe Kim, she's good. She, I mean, as a snowboarder, but come on, uh, the Olympics. Yeah. I mean, the Summer Olympics, the Summer Games. No, Suni, she's Suni, fantastic. yeah, she's a great one. I, I mean, you know, she ought to be on more, and I don't know how come she's not getting like, you know, cereal box treatment and stuff, you know, because. Uh, well, she should, especially. Well, you know, she's competing for sponsorships. Auburn. She's competing for Auburn, and now the NCAA rules allow right. for uh, for athletes to take advantage. I think she's cleaning. I think she's doing well. I, I but I, I, you know, we mentioned some things uh, like uh, surrounding the the Jussie Smollett case. <laughs> you know, when she claimed that something happened to her, and she didn't file a report. I, you know, I she's so famous and she's so beloved. No one's going to question whether or not something really happened. So, but I, and I don't want to be involved in any kind of conspiracy. But on this show, someone, you know, put in chat when we were talking about it a couple couple of months ago. Is it could she be telling the truth or could she be, you know, mm -hmm. is it possible she's fibbing? I don't know. I. Yeah. I, I hope not. Anyway, so like, those are the stories. How about the good stuff? You know, are we going to close out soon? I think mean, we're getting close, aren't we? Yeah, we're getting close. What is what is the good stuff that you want to talk about? I mean, well, no, I, I mean, I'm, I think I'm asking I think, you. You go. I think the good stuff. The okay. good stuff is the story we talked. To, I talked about last week. The Artula family, you know, mm -hmm. who showed the grace to essentially forgive the ex girlfriend who prosecutors say badgered their son into committing suicide. And, you know, the case was going to go to trial. The the young woman who is, uh, you know, South Korean, In Young Young, In Young, uh, young or In Young Yu is her name. Uh, she could have faced, you know, 20, 30, 40 years in prison. Um, the, the Artula family allowed her to cop a deal. Mm -hmm. plead guilty and get probation and it spared everyone from you know having to relive the trial i think as I, I was talking about it to a friend he called it radical compassion that's pretty good yeah i think it well it is radical well in in this context in the context of the the world and the nation as it is the culture yeah. as it is it's certainly radical but it's merely christian Yes, yes. It's love it's your neighbor. Real love your basic. Yeah. yeah. And and it, it showed forgiveness. Love, love and forgiveness. And mm -hmm. it also showed what happens when you give to you know, you get more than you give. Mm -hmm. You get more than you give when you take it to that level. Because their act of forgiveness became that act of self compassion and love. And it it's there to help them get over this grief, 
which mm-hmm. they have. So I, I, I thought that, you know, for Christmas, that was a great story. Um, when the day, a couple days before Christmas, day before Christmas Eve, that story breaks in the Boston Globe and in young you pleads guilty, gets probation. The family, the Ortula family shows no, 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 no vengeance, no reprisal. They are able to live with their grief. And I, I just thought that's something to follow. That's something that we can hold up as a model. So, you know, yeah, I, I just think that as an individual instance, um, if, if you were to uh, extrapolate, right, and say, okay, uh, rather than you, you were asking me, uh, will Asian Americans rise uh, to a level of anger that uh, will motivate them to act against uh, Asian hate? Um, you know, how practical is it to, to have a, a movement based on, quote, stopping Asian hate, unquote? Uh, is it the hate that we're concerned with or the more immediate possibility of violence, of, of political and social action by groups of people, right, uh, that are harmful to uh, Asians in America? Okay, that's, that's the question that I have. Um, yeah. and, I, and I guess saying stop Asian hate deals with what people think is the source, right, of the actions, uh, so that that you'll stop the actions by stopping the hate. Um, I just don't think you can stop the hate. Well, I don't think it's enough. I think I, when I ask that question, I don't mean that people rise up in anger necessarily. I don't want them to rise up in anger. Right. I want them to be like the Ortulas. Right. To see that there is a better way to get at the results of a, a loving, peaceful world where we all get to be who we are and get to contribute what we have as Asian Americans, African Americans, as white Americans, we, we get to live in this diverse world. You know, maybe that's a little too uh, idealistic, a little too lovey dovey, but, you know, we're going to come up to this, you know, people have to lead by example. And I think if we if we want a model for how to act, I think the Artula family in, in the case of the, the Boston College suicide is a perfect example of how to behave on a on a public level. I mean, I'm not saying you don't rise up. You don't. It is a rising up. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's not a rising up in anger. It's a rising up in with, with love. They're reacting. They are being critical. You know, they're not. They're not saying that the that what she did was okay. Yeah. Uh, that well, my my follow up question is: Is that justice? Is there? Uh, you know, the, the penalty now has come down to probation. Yeah. And and I don't know how long the term is. Uh, are you aware of it? It's usually yeah, three 10 years. Ten oh, years. really? That's long. Yeah. Wow, that's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. I th- I thought it was the, the the typical, you know, three to five uh, years of probe. No, but- the, the the prosecutor wanted to come down hard, hard on this girl. She right. got a two and a half year suspended sentence and ten years of probation. Right. right. So, uh, you know, and and this was. This was in conjunction prosecutor with the Ortula family, and and the Ortula family said said this, which which also got me. We bear no feelings of anger or reprisal. Mm-hmm. That was the family said we believe that time will take us through in the moments we mourn and celebrate his Alex Ortula's life, and and to me, that was the cue for us to to learn from this go forward and understand where we can go in 2022 as an Asian American community in, in terms of the 10,000 instances, in terms of 
it's always like the bigger thing. Although I know that there's some people who are, you, you know, he may want to, you know, get, well, anger motivates, but anger has to subside if we want to get to a solution. That's that right. We, that we all live with. I think uh, in terms of group action, um, younger members of the community, uh, people in their 30-somethings and uh, 40-somethings, uh, organized uh, defense watches and, yeah. and circulated through uh, areas of San Francisco where there's a significant amount of Asian Americans carrying on their lives and uh, restaurants and uh, community services, right? Everything from banking to uh, pharmacies, uh, hardware stores, you know, little small community centers uh, of business and, and, and activity. Yeah. Uh, and I thought that was a, a very uh, useful uh, method. Yeah, uh, I think that all that is is great. I, I, um, I just know that a lot of people right now are wondering – how to act, how to, how do right, we get right. forward? You right. know, th you know, th this thing is coming up. We're going to get justice, but you know, in the other two cases or, or in two of the, the six cases that this Robert Aaron long in, in Atlanta was uh, convicted, he's already been convicted of the, the crimes in Cherokee, Cherokee County, but now Fulton County, they are going to go after uh, Robert Aaron long for, for, for hate crimes. Right. So that, that'll be interesting to see how the, the community responds. But I think, I hope that, like I said, the Artulas are used as a model. And, uh, and that's why I'm into, let's be reborn. We're the right. new year baby. <laughs> We're the new year baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone gets a new year baby. You get to be the new year baby. Yeah. That's what resolutions are about. It's a, you know, it's a partial rebirth, right? At least when the people are doing resolutions. Yeah. Uh, and, and and my resolution this year, I put it right on top of my, I'm going to stay negative. I hope to stay, <laughs> I negative. Yeah. I hope to stay <laughs> negative and all my COVID testing. And I, I hope that people get COVID testing. I mean, they're saying that this yeah, is the PCRs. Not, yeah. They're, they're saying is not as good. Well, you know, That's right. the 93%, not bad. For, well, it's I, good for everything up to Delta at about, you know, 80%, 80, 85%. It's just, they're saying that it's no good for uh, uh, Omicron. Well, it's it'll tell you where, where you are, but it might give you a false, a false negative, positive. a false negative, false negative, false yeah. negative. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, okay. So the best thing really is to stay in your box. That's stay right. In your zoom box. Stay yeah. In your Get that, get the righteous mask. And, and, uh, yeah. well, no, forget the mask. You got the, this, this is our, oh, mask. you mean, oh, okay, being away from people, just yeah. isolation. Stay here and then, yeah. uh, lift up. I noticed you started drinking on me. Right. Well, you know, I just didn't want to cough. Well, okay. But it is, uh, let's see, it's, uh, you got to keep the right. trach a little moist, you know. It's midnight in Amsterdam. Okay. <laughs> Happy New okay. Year. Okay, my day going by on town. It's it's uh, it's midnight in Berlin. Actually, it's twelve oh nine in Berlin. Oh, uh, okay. So it's okay. pregnancy well, New Year's. So yeah, according to uh, Filipino time. Yeah, a little bit, just a little, a little late. A little late. A little, a little late. late. A little late. There are late. a lot of Filipinos in Germany. I know a lot of Filipinos in Germany. A lot of Filipinos. Look, we're an hour away from uh, Filipinos in London. And mm -hmm. Filipinos in Edinburgh. Yeah, and there's a few. Way. There's a few there too. Yeah, I, so, I you was, know, but see, London, um, what, Amsterdam, Copenhagen. Uh, that's a different Filipino crowd, man. I mean, we're not talking I, about. I know. Yeah, they're a little more on the elite side, you know. That, well, that, wait a minute. Wait a minute. A lot of them are just the Filipinos who are able to leave, right? I mean, maybe subsequent. I mean. The the real elites have left. They left the Philippines in the sixties and seventies, and they came to America. But people who weren't able to, you know, they they might have gone to Europe or Canada. I I was surprised to see all the Filipinos. In, well, in, in some a lot of, just, yeah, a lot of the people who left during the the during the martial law period, right, um, were not elite. 
but they were kind of middle class, yeah. but they were uh, lefties. There were people on the range of the left, and as, and if you were even a little bit to the left, maybe even a centrist, you could still be uh, attacked, purged, and and potentially imprisoned. Uh, and if you were serious left, uh, you'd be considered uh, revolutionary and uh, maybe get uh, salvaged. Remember that term? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and so a lot of people left, and they went to countries that were. Uh, more tolerant of political dissidents than the United States. That you know, people who were on the left in the Philippines and who were potentially uh, attacked. Some of them actually were attacked and imprisoned, at least for a short period, of time, short period of time, relatively short period of time, and then tortured yeah. during that period. And and when they were able to escape the Philippines, uh, they saw the United States as 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 colleagues, <laughs> you know, the U.S. government were colleagues of the Marcos government, and so uh, they didn't want to come here. Well, I just, they, uh, I just they went know to London I, and Amsterdam. I when I go to when when I've been to Europe and I you know like I I I, I walk around, I'm surprised it's, to see as many Filipinos. Yep, and, and some of them are you know service workers, and some yep. of them aren't. Some of them are in like. Part yeah, of those the are the diaspora. newer folks. Yeah, yeah that's definitely of, true. Yeah, part of the diaspora. My, my I had a, a cousin who went from uh, Manila to Dubai, Manila to Italy, you know, right. all throughout the, the 70s, 80s. And so yeah, I we're, had, we're I far had. flung, the far flung Filipinos. So, uh, Dan. Uh, was she an engineer? <laughs> no, no, she was. These were not perfect. These were service workers. Okay. Okay. So some of them were, um, you know, they just found themselves there. They, you know, love has its way of working. And they, you know, suddenly I didn't see my cousin coming back to America. She just stayed there. And uh, this is the fam the family stories we have in the yeah. American community. Yeah. For the first time, uh, my, my experience was that for the first time, there were people who were going to Europe. And uh, the Middle East, right? Saudi and the UAE and all that, uh, Kuwait. Yeah. Uh, be and and they were professionals. Yeah. And, and rather than uh, service workers, and so I had uh, a cousin from the same hometown as as my mother, a small town uh, on a small island in the Visayas, uh, and she was a doctor. Ah. Uh, and uh, and she met her husband in. Uh, Germany, no, in uh, Saudi, and uh, he's an engineer. Uh -huh. So you got the two stereotypes, right? Except she's not a nurse; she's a doctor. And they yeah. meet in uh, Europe or or in the Middle East, and they get married, and their their kids are raised in Europe and all that. Uh, I've had that. Linda's had that happen in her side of the family as well. You know, because yeah. you had you had Filipinos that were in the U.S. military stationed in those countries. And then when they have little cultural soirees and get togethers, yeah. uh, they run into nurses, right? <laughs> right. Who are all over the place in Europe. And so, uh, those marriages happen. And the nursing industry has done more for not just medicine, but for immigration. Right. Right. And, uh, and we can toast to that with the mocktails. Well, that's, a, that's a good one. Let's yeah. toast to some, uh, hopeful, uh, activities. You're asking me what's hopeful. Um, yeah. People are saying gerrymandering is, is you know, I, I've got people who are arguing with me that, look, man, uh, you keep you keep talking about the possibilities, right? That the Democrats can follow certain patterns that will preserve, help help protect democracy uh, from uh, the uh, huge vote that's going to come down in favor of the Republicans. They're going to retake at least the House, if not the House and the Senate. And I said, well... You know, uh, a lot of the stuff that they're doing is based on the census uh, and gerrymandering. And what they've done is really a ridiculous amount of gerrymandering that's so obvious uh, yeah. that it's probably unconstitutional. And there is the key. Will people in those red states bring mm -hmm. cases to the federal courts? You Because it's useless, right, to go to the state courts. Okay, because it's a state issue. So you got to go and fight under the U.S. Constitution, you know, equal protection, 
14th Amendment as well as 15th Amendment voting rights, okay? Uh, and uh, I think that's going to happen. Uh, I think it's it's unavoidable. In, uh, so where does that put us in terms of the, the midterm elections? That's, that's the point. How fast do those cases come up? And I would be saying uh, mandatory injunctions. You can't, you can't put those gerrymandering uh, 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 efforts in place uh, during this election. Wait, or, wait, that, that means old, we go back to the old districts? Uh, well, they may even say you got to you gotta allow a, a, a third party. Now, that takes time. And so I don't know if it's going to uh, be effective for the midterms in 22. Uh, but you're going to see a whole lot of action uh, wow. taken in, those, in that fashion, in that direction. That, that and is, and that some is, of it's already effective. Some of it's already been effective because, no. uh, 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 you know, even though the Republicans drew up these plans, uh, they're having to pull them back down. Uh, and the news coverage hasn't caught up with that yet. I'm hopeful that this next week they will catch yeah, up with you know, that. It has been very confusing trying to get the maps, trying to get that's the right, maps. That's right. That's right. California is all kind of topsy turvy. Yeah. Uh, there are some new districts that are you know, more Latino than not. Uh, Daly City, the Filipino area has been, I don't know, it's kind of weird, but yes. still Filipino. Yeah, oh. it, it's it's been weird though. You know, it reaches into San Francisco, and goes all the way down, uh, you know, towards Santa Clara. But, yeah, uh, you know, it's been I, weird. I I I just don't understand. Um, and that Spear Spear is 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 uh, not coming back. She's not right. going to run again. So then the question is, who's going to run? So that's another conversation we got to have. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, no. it's obviously more local, and you have a national reach. Well. You know, uh, but but still, it's important. Spears Spears an important person in Congress who takes her place. Um, I was surprised when she decided she wasn't going to run, but I knew that she was also very important to the Filipino community. So I wanted her to run for for the Senate position, you know, because Feinstein is not going to run again, right? Well, I don't so. know. I don't know if Feinstein is going to run again. Uh, uh, I think she wants to hang in there. Until, uh, she may want to, but I don't know. I think she's under a lot of pressure to get the hell there's out. There's a lot of people who do not like Diane Feinstein, and maybe I don't think it's it's because they don't like her. It's because uh, I think it's because of her age. But here's the thing: in the Senate, in Congress, it's all about seniority. Why do you want to give up that kind of power? I think if she, it's she, really powerful. Yeah, people don't it, understand the Senate, but I mean, it, when you look at Mansion and Cinema and see the effect they're having. Yeah. You can see how powerful one position could be, you know. And I think people need to understand that, okay, look, if Diane Feinstein gets more into a power sharing mode and people are able to use her from their position, wherever they are in the generational spectrum or the ethnic spectrum, I think she retains her speech, speech, uh, seat, seat, <laughs> I'm, I'm drinking a mocktail. Yeah, you, see, yeah, you say it's mock, but I think... It's uh, a mock Hey, look, you're you're mocking our mock. This is just a saffron drink. Okay. Saffron. Saffron no, comes from Afghanistan, and you know what else they make in Afghanistan. Oh, wait. No, no, no. This is no saffron. I don't know. Come on. The crocus when was plant. your last trip to the Middle East, Mr. Guillermo? This is a crocus <laughs> plant special. It's non alcoholic. It's it's like a virgin um uh it's mostly coffee. I put I put saffron in coffee and then that's good. Cool. Yeah. I gotta try fun. that. This I have to try that. I mean, you put people make saffron tea, so I put saffron yeah, in yeah. coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like uh, I feel like uh, you know, like uh, Donovan. Well, it's it's powdered the the powdered saffron. So you no, just, no, no, well, the, the the crocus leaves. The, the, the crocus stuff. leaf. The, so yeah, it's an actual tea. Yeah. The actual tea. You're right. So okay. the stuff that you would put in your uh, paella or your uh, uh, you know your your luscious, uh, uh, you know, saffron uh, type of uh, paella is the, is the dish that most people use, uh, right? Saffron. But I, I well, you just you just went ahead and made me hungry. Uh, ah, yeah, okay. I so just thought of my favorite paella joint over on Twenty Second Street. But uh, see, I haven't had paella in a long time because, well, you know, I like the rice. I can make. <laughs> I can make my rice yellow with all. Yeah, sorts but it's of got food. all that seafood in it, right? You don't do I that. You put tofu. You replace the seafood with tofu. Right, it's right. fine. Yeah. Hey, so so Dan, uh, I I like this idea though. I thought 
you know, if we all if we all are reborn and we have uh, we have our baby moment. Mm-hmm. We should we should we should all just be one big maternity ward. <laughs> yeah. Birthing rebirthing ourselves because no, I'm serious, because you know, a lot of people are depressed right now. Yeah. Right? It's a, a postnatal people, ward. The maternity yeah. ward is when they're yeah. yeah. They have yeah. not yet given birth. <laughs> yeah. Just remember to breathe. Yeah. Breathe and uh <laughs> Oh, and, and remember, you bring them back too many nasty memories of that. And, that and just remember, the epidural is just. just oh like, my God! Yeah, that snip that when they get in there with that surprise snip. Oh my God! It's just a reach away. Hey, look. But you know the thing is, I I I'm serious about my column where I say we should be the new year baby. We should be born again. We should be, because if if we approach everything like we don't know anything. You know, then we don't know that we don't have the anger. We don't have the, you know, we, we, we can just be fresh and new. And maybe there's the hope that we can get to where we need to be. You know, maybe, mm-hmm. maybe, maybe that we can get to where we need to be on all these issues that we've talked about uh, from the Atlanta killings, Vincent Chin's 40th, you know all the transgressions we we might uh, can, you know we might face in 2022 because it's not over right i mean <laughs> no i mean it's not over that people still have a a thing against asians oh yeah i expect it to get uh, worse uh, do you do you really i mean I, I i'm just, i'm saying that i mean i haven't really ever phrased it that way that people have a thing against asians but you get 10,000 instances and there's a thing that people have about There them. seems to be, as we used to say in sociology class, right? A distinct pattern developing. <laughs> but, you know, this has happened all throughout our lives, though, right? Yes, yes. I Absolutely. Mean, back to our Father's Day, our day. Uh, I was talking to, and I'm going to, I'm gonna, she's going to be on my podcast uh, next week. I, I talked to a, a young uh, uh, Harvard student. And she wrote a piece about how she uh, was just wondering why aren't there any Filipino or Tagalog classes at Harvard? You know, why isn't there an Asian American studies, uh, you know, program that's worth a darn? You know, why isn't there a a Filipino studies at Harvard worth a darn? And should have gone to Princeton. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, at at different places there, but but why? Tell me about yeah. Harvard, Dan. You, your College of Ethnic Studies, right. San Francisco State. What is the problem with Harvard? I think they got the same problem Stanford does. I, I you know, what's uh, that? Tom. Stanford doesn't even uh, recognize when when they look at racial quote racial minorities. Uh, Asians have never been uh, considered racial minorities in the way that. African Americans, Latinx peoples, and Pacific Islanders, Native Americans have been considered. And so they've never had uh, a special admissions program. In fact, back in the 70s, uh, some old friends of, of, of mine um, uh, were, uh, they got a job being liaison uh, between uh, Asian American students and student organizations and the administration. Uh, they they, it was that serious, them. and they actually funded them because uh, th- th- this was during the period when people were saying uh, minorities only got into Berkeley and Stanford uh, right. because of uh, affirmative action, and that they would not have gotten in without it and all that stuff. And so, right. so Asian American, yeah, they do, they do, they do, they still say that, um, and it's still wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but. <laughs> you know? but, but so Stanford, only a small percentage, right, of yeah. of, of Asians uh, get in because of affirmative action programs. Very small, and and uh, the ma- the vast majority get in uh, according to you know the typical uh, merit based uh, well, admissions well, they're program. Qualified. The problem. Yes, is they're qualified. There are only so many spaces. It's that's a right. Resource issue, and that's right. why a lot of people don't get in. That's and, right. But it's not people who should, you know, people who don't, you know, people who shouldn't get in aren't getting in. Right. Uh, it's people, people all qualified are getting in. That's and right. and so, 
I, so get, get back to the question about why Harvard doesn't have an Asian American studies program. Uh, you know, they're extreme traditionalists. I think they're influenced by the, you know, their location, you know, it's North, Northeast and all that. Yeah. Um, and uh, to, you know, Princeton is an odd duck, right? Because uh, they had an, a real strong interest in, in Asia. And so they had what we would call, uh, you know, the old Asian studies programs. And, and, and they were actually regional foreign studies programs. It's not Asian American, right? right? That's the point, right? It's not about people living in the Americas and in the United States particularly. Uh, but because they had a strong interest in the Philippines and they had a lot of Philippine uh, material, right, during the, from the occupation of the colonial occupation, right, of the Philippines, uh, you know, th it was kind of natural that they would also do a little bit of Filipino-American. Well, wait a minute, Dan. The, the, yeah. My conversation with this Harvard student is that she went down into the Pusey Library of Harvard, mm -hmm. and, of course, she discovers that uh, this guy Atkinson – was the first superintendent of education in the Philippines under yeah. that colonial government, a Harvard guy. Yeah. You know, and he, he invented the pensionado program. Right. So, yeah. you know, that's, that should, I guess we have to explain the pensionado program now. No, huh? no, it well, it's a, it's where the Filipinos were allowed to come to America to study. Yeah. Well, and they competed, they competed through a national examination schedule. Right. And they're mostly in the Philippines, and the people who scored well uh, would be brought to uh, uh, the equivalent of Ivy League institutions th throughout the country. So major state universities, like uh, University of California, University of Washington, uh, University of Texas, even some interesting stories came out of those Pensionados experiences, and also the Ivy League, you know, uh, all Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Cornell, etc. So is all right. So to go back to the the Filipino American student, she discovers all this. I mean, it's it's widely known, but very few people are 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 hitting on these sources. Mm -hmm. And then I was like the only person to, to have ever you know looked at this in the last month or so. Mm -hmm. uh, and but they have a wealth of this information. You said that Princeton, they have their pl plan because they had a wealth of, of information. Mm -hmm. what, what else is at play that prevents something from happening at Harvard? When you do, if you're going to do Asian studies, they would be more open to that as they were at UC Berkeley, right? Um, but even at UC Berkeley, and, and I'm not saying Harvard is UC Berkeley, but UC Berkeley, uh, they didn't like teaching Tagalog. They didn't like, te well, it's, it's called Filipino now and has been for a few decades. But they didn't like teaching Filipino because they they said, you know, uh, the Philippines is 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 colonized nation. It's 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 really more Western than any of the other nations. It's and uh, and so uh, they didn't want to spend uh, money, right? Because uh, it takes money to fund a a course that you open to the students. All right. So here's the okay. thing. And then yeah. at Harvard, how many people are going to attend that class? So, okay. but here's the thing, Dan. Harvard now has $45 million that Asian Americans have given Asian American. Tech. How much of that originated from Filipino donors? Well, I don't know. Probably not many. I well, mean, a lot, of, a lot of it is East Asian, but that's the, it. The, fact, the fact is, if you we got, got that problem here with the Asian art museum, right? Yeah. Right. I mean, but this is, but that's another issue that she brings up. And that's why it's an, it's an interesting conversation that, Will not be on the Emil Guillermo Emil Mux Takeout live stream, but the Emil Mux Takeout podcast, which I'll release this week. Uh, but it's an interesting conversation about the split uh, right, you know, right. between Filipinos and Asian Americans, right? And um, you know, does does the term Asian American still serve Filipinos well? And uh, it's it's fifty fifty. I think I think we can, we can uh, take benefits from the actions of um, Asian Americans, particularly in instances where we also are uh, participants, really active participants for I immigration issues, for example. We're, we're active participants, but Filipinos have a tendency to to want to do things isolatedly and exclusively as Filipinos. 
um, uh, they contradict my, my general perspective on how to make social movements work and how to get political uh, change, social change through political and legal activism. It's all about building relationships with allies. You know, I mean, we, we, we do not have an insignificant population in the United States, but, you know, you can't play up our influence either. Uh, yeah. and, and the major reason is we don't have enough of an economic face. Uh, and I, I, I dislike doing this publicly, but I'm going to do it anyway. And that Go is, ahead. please, please. Well, we've been here. Uh, you know, Filipinos like to claim we got here in the, you know, the Manila men and, and Louisiana and all that. Okay. And my argument is, okay, that's fine, but there's not a continuity of history where we can show strong continuity of history from that point onward. There are people who, who can say, you know, I have evidence that there were Filipinos in my lineage. Okay. But that's not the same as having kind of an institutional continuity. So we're really a dynasty phenomenon at the at the earliest in terms of of us recognizing our place. We could also claim right uh, uh, moral rock and all that, you know. Uh, Wait, when do we when do we start our uh, it's a 19th century phenomenon? Starting from when, like 1898? Uh, that's a little late. I think we can probably go a little earlier than that. Probably uh, uh, close though. I would say 1880s, late 1880s. That's not that far off. 1880s. Yeah, it? yeah. No, no. You, I, I said that's close. 1898 yeah. is close. I mean, it, uh, it, it accelerated around 1896, 97, 98 a little bit. Because but, of the Philippine American War. Yeah, and then the pensionados started coming in after 1906, right? And there's small numbers of people, so uh, that kept increasing. Uh, through the teens, right, the the the, the second decade, and then Dan, came the 1924 Exclusion Act, right? Yeah, but Dan, it's really a 20th century thing. Yes, yes, that's my point. It is, not, not but a, not a 19th century. But thing. one of the complaints that people that were the founders of funds, for example, have uh, about the post 1965 arrivals is uh, that they see little or no value in the previous generations. Uh, you know, there's a lot of resentment there that they don't they don't care about the pre 1965 story, and a lot of the folks uh, are somewhat elitist and and see themselves as the better uh, demonstration of what it is to be a Filipino. When you they're, say, they're more authentic. <laughs> when you say the post 65, yeah, the, 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 which is where people come to America because the the immigration the reform laws, act. yeah right we're, we're opened up in 65 yeah though so they are now pretty much the dominant force yeah them and the following uh, members of their families right that 80s, were able to come in through family reunification 80s 2000s yes meanwhile all right the pre-65 right they're the people of our fathers yeah, um, I mean, the people who came in the in the twenties. Certainly, the more humble, came, hum, so-called humble origins. Right. right. The people who came in the World War Two. Right. The people who came, there, you know, and that we really essentially were the war brides who came right. in World War Two, started having babies, and started having people like me. Right. And so our relationship or our yeah, our relationship to America was not as, even though we were born in America and are American citizens, we are not really seen as Americans. We're seen yeah. as really the immigrants. Right. We're, 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 we, we, are, we are not distinguished from our, our, our parents who were the immigrants. Right. And should be, they should be really the first they're the first first generation but as our as their offspring we are not the second generation as we should be logically right we are the first generation we're we're treated as though we're first generation yeah you know anthropologically right first generation are the people who arrive here from a foreign place right but we're not okay. even the 1.5s i mean 
to be charitable, you could say maybe you're 1.5, but we're not. We're like, we're treated like we're the first. Yeah, uh, it's true. Uh, and, it's, and that has and, held and, us And back. the fact that post-1965 and post- uh, and martial law period yeah. arrivals, right, um, okay. uh, make us look like a fresh immigrant population. And they came over in large numbers, right? I mean, and the, they the, just the, totally forget about pre-65. That's it. And that's that's the attitude that uh, and, and perspective that a lot of the four, uh, the f founders of the uh, Filipino American National Historical Society. That's that's the that's a, the complaint that they have against. And it's it. a real one because it know, is it's, real. It's just like the Vietnamese immigrants, right? Yes. Because they, yeah, they that's have a good this, comparison. They have this generational thing, and if you know anything about your food, you know you have your pho, <laughs> pho five and pho six. You know they 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 name their fuzz by <laughs> the year. Uh -huh. of the immigration or what I it, it's it's linked to the the generation. This is the recipe. Yeah, but they, yeah, but they don't call it boat fa. There's not boat fa. They don't call it boat fa. <laughs> right, but we 82, have, 81, 82 fa. Yeah, but Filipinos, we should have. This At year. least you pronounce it correctly, you know. Yeah, yeah, but the, yeah. I always Filipino. wanted to open a joint called what the fa. What the? Fu I've seen a what the fuck. That's what I heard, man. One of my students said, "Oh, sir, they already have one." And I said, "Oh God, they have a what the fuck." But we should have, we should have Olympia, Olympia sixty five, Olympia sixty. <laughs> we should have Olympia sixty two, and then we should have, we should have Olympia sixty eight, the Marcos yeah. Olympia. Not yeah. so big, not so big, but do we have the big? <laughs> well, we should have Olympia. We should have Olympia like 62, Olympia 45, Olympia, uh, like a post-World War Olympia. That would be like Olympia. Yeah, no, we could do a, we could do a pre-World War II Olympia. <laughs> you no, know, the no, ba no. A bachelor society Olympia. And I'm thinking oh, about all kinds of possibilities. So. Olympia 20, <laughs> Olympia 29, <laughs> Olympia 29. Uh -huh. And then we have, uh, and then and then that's mostly uh wow you know think about what they ate in 1929 but that that's depression that would be a skinny lumpia <laughs> the cigar a cigar, cigar. style lumpia yeah and then yeah well, lumpia, that's what lumpia shanghai kind of reminds me of that right yeah the little I, snacky ones yeah I, you know we never had I mean, my mom was always like she lumpia her war bride lumpia which would be like lumpia 55 lumpia 55 yeah, that's a good year. It was. Yeah, yeah. Olympia 55, a uh, war bride. Uh, yeah, vegetable. Disneyland, Disneyland opened that summer. I know. That's why it's good. It's, yeah. it's you know, and then, then, and then you have the, the post 65 Olympia, which is yeah. Marcos Olympia. Small and stingy. Look at Olympia. Could we put? Say, so, anyway, Alex, we discovered something here. We discovered, <laughs> uh, but, but this is important. This is important because this is part of the ethnic history that is going to be part of our curriculum yeah. uh, in California. And you, you're predicting that. Yeah, what's going to be there, though? See, it all comes down to this. Okay, now you got the commitment and you got the law on your side. Now it's about content. What's the content? What's the perspective? And lastly, who's going to teach it? So you make it a requirement. Are there enough teachers who are going to be willing to learn this stuff? Uh, which which ethnic groups, you know, get priority? And how do you fit all that stuff in a textbook? You know, you know how many different kind of ethnic groups there are in in, in, in California? Yeah, well, I know. I, I know that. Well, I mean, in Daly City, they're going to have to be teaching Filipino. Yeah, sure. Yeah, maybe it'll go like that. But then, you know... Um, what is it going to go? Chicano, Latino, uh, almost everywhere else, and uh, black in the in the urban areas, you know. Well, you know, how many times Native people, American? Tell me how many times have you heard about Kwanzaa the last week? Not as much as I thought I would. Yeah, that's kind of weird, huh? I mean, it's like they just uh, mentioned it on the day and maybe the next day, but that's about I, it. I heard someone mention like, what is the first third? third day of Kwanzaa. What right, 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 right. But, but I have not heard it, and maybe that shows something about the segregation in media, right, segregation right. of communities, 
because you know in some areas they're talking about Kwanzaa. You know, right. I'm talking about, you know, Oakland, parts of LA. They're talking about Kwanzaa like it's real. But you know, for the most part, I just I, I've seen maybe one or two mentions in the mainstream. And mm -hmm. um it's important because I think Kwanzaa is a great holiday. It's secular, but it's real. It talks about renewal. It talks right. about all the things that we need to talk about after uh, a, a spiritual holiday like 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 Christmas. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's I think it's pretty cool. I so, think it was a good. That was one of the good things that happened this year, right? The official recognition of Juneteenth. Juneteenth. Oh yeah, and, uh, that, that's know. a positive thing. And here's yeah. here, and I I mention it in my my column on the aldef blog aldef.org slash blog uh -huh. and how juneteenth june 19th the the day that vincent Chin, they found out oh okay that's when he got his head bashed in right the first day it was he got he got into the altercation with uh, with evens and then it took three or four days before he died but it happened on June 19th. So if you go to my column, I say, well, what did what was Vincent Chin doing on June 19th? Now, look, I say this about Vincent Chin, and this is why Filipinos need to have the big umbrella of Asian America, because this is our story, too. Right. I mean, we're we're part of this. I mean, as much as we want to, like, extricate and be our own thing. Big umbrella. Big, we got to be Big Ten Asian American. Yeah. Well, the lesson to be learned, uh, at least in part, from the the Chin case, yeah. is is that uh, he was he was uh, he's Chinese, yeah. But he was he was given the generic treatment, and uh, you know the, the people don't really care to distinguish between somebody's ethnicity, and you know, but they were their intentions were anti-Japanese in attitude and intention, right. Um, but the lesson to be learned from Filipinos by Filipinos is could have been you. They they don't know the difference. They don't yeah. tell people who are racist. You know, all they see is tight eyes and 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 typical hair, right? Typical dark hair. And but, they will stop me or you, yeah. and they will say, "Hey, you 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 you're Chinese or you're yeah. you know." And they'll they'll make some kind like I remember this is true. I with my first time in Harlem. I got off on 116th Street on the subway, walked mm -hmm. the wrong way. I was supposed to go to Columbia University right, just right. to visit. I walked the wrong way. I'm in Harlem. You and went people, You went west, like, east instead of west? Yeah, and people started running away from me because they they thought, oh, you know, like, what, what's he doing here? And he's he's Asian. He, he knows karate. Yeah, and, kung fu, kung fu. Kung fu. And, Haka! And one, one, one kid thought I, I was Bruce Lee. Yeah, yeah there it is. Because, yeah, you know, I had a, you know, I'll have to show you some pictures of me. Well, you, you know, it's because you kept on going, ha, ha, ha. Yeah. you know, you got it. Well, you can't. Yeah. What do you expect I, when you get off the, the, the subway and that's how you greet people? Ha, but, ha, ha. But, but it's true. We will be known. I mean, we are confused as, as you know, for being different ethnicities and the perps, they don't. They won't notice a difference. They don't. They don't. They don't. Yeah. I got when, uh, you know, pick up baseball and, yeah. uh, at the local park. I'd go over there and uh, and uh, uh, they would start choosing up. And you know how you grip the bat and you top off on the bat? You yeah. know how that's how they choose sides. And then the guy gets to choose, right? Yeah. And when it came time to me, and I was usually the last choice, you were the, the last, choice? last choice, either the last or the second to the last. And so they would say, what side of the war did your father fight on? No. I swear to God. That no. was one of the that was one of the vetting questions was what side of the war did your father fight on? And I said, uh, well, he did in fact fight in the war and he was wearing an American uniform. He fought in the US Army. Uh but and and at least half of those guys would look at me with doubt. <laughs> like, are you really? Yeah, they want to prove it. Yeah. See, this is the thing, and this is what us pre sixty fives had to deal with. Yeah, that the post sixty fives don't understand. Right, and this is a new thing. I look, I'm going to stand up for the pre sixty fives because okay. uh, because that's our group. That's our group. Yep, that's our group. And and you know, we were Americans 
you know, long before we were yep. born here. Yep. The birthright citizenship, thanks to Wong Kim Ark. Yep. Wong Kim Ark, who gave us, was it the 14th Amendment? It Wong was uh, equal protection, yeah. Equal protection. Mm -hmm. Wong Kim Ark, look it up, folks. Oh, and citizenship. Uh, citizenship. It's a, Their citizenship is in the first clause of the, of Birth, the 14th Amendment. Birthright citizenship. That's right. You're born on this ground. You are an American. You are and citizens of a state, and you're a citizen of the United States. So why is it that in America, the Filipinos who were born here, you know why we were we were we you know the pre 65s were treated like we were the immigrants and that has always bothered me when i i heard peter Jamero, mm -hmm, who mm -hmm. is in his 90s mm -hmm, mm -hmm. he said you know he was lucky i would be like peter Jamero. i would be 90 my father came in the 20s but his father had a wife and was able to have a family mm -hmm. so we should revere peter Jamero as He's a full American, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he went to UCLA, his brother Herb. You know, it was it was it was great. He's got the Filipino He was American. also a co-founder of Fonts. And then co yeah, and, co and that whole that whole generation of people, right, yeah. had similar experiences to to Peter. Yeah. You know, and, the stories were, you know, and he's a great storyteller, right? And he's yeah. still doing it. He still comes up well, with new stuff. Uh, you know, he's I, evergreen, as we like to say. I, I love, I love Peter, but I, when I talked to him recently, uh, last year, one thing that stood out, he said, you know, Emil, people, we were born here and people thought we were no different than our dads. They yeah. thought that we were jet, we were immigrants like our dads and we were the Americans. Sure. I got, I got that even, even, uh, uh, I think in high school, I got, I, I'd be, I'd be going downtown to meet somebody at a restaurant, right? Because some of my, you know, I went to SI, and so some of my cohort were uh, from wealthy families, and they were restaurant restaurateurs and all that. Yeah. And uh, I'd get invited somewhere, and people would uh, hear me talk, and they'd say, "Hey, you speak English really well." And I said, well, I think you mean um, I speak English in an accent that's familiar to you because everybody's got an accent, right? Yeah. And they said, yeah. And I said, well, that's because I was born here, you know. Yeah. And they look at you quizzically. Yeah, like, like born here? Really? Yeah. Okay. Or you get this. Did you get this one? Where are you from? Yeah. Oh, you know? we all, <laughs> and or, I'd say, yeah. I'd say uh, San Francisco. Yeah, that yeah. yeah, that's just a variation of you know, go home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm here yeah. already. Yeah, I was where are you from? Okay. Where are you and from? I'd say San Francisco. Okay, where are your parents from? <laughs> you yeah, know? Not, yeah. Let's pinpoint the racism. The, the, not Philippi the, <laughs> the so, Philippines. Oh, yeah, the Philippines. Yeah. yeah. So, I, and I, you know, and this happens if you're if you're Asian American. It happens if you're Filipino, Chinese. Yeah. Taiwanese, Japanese, yep. Japanese, Vietnamese. So for I mean that that's why we have our big tent. Right. That's why. We, well, I think we need each other. We need each other because uh, of our numbers. You know, we oh, just don't, we don't have large numbers. The other thing is we need each other because we are we're spread out throughout the country. Yeah, you know, and there are some places where we have heavy concentrations. Uh, the people who who had almost instant growth yeah. uh, and then therefore tried to go on their own without reference to the Asian American thing yeah. were the Koreans and the South Asians, the Indians particularly. And look at, look at how, see, one of the comparisons that I make in my classes, uh, particularly the Filipino class, I said, take a look, man. I mean, did you notice all the South, South Asians that are experts in their fields? You know, in, this, in science and, and medicine, particularly, right? But there's also a lot of journalists, yeah. uh, Asian Americans, yeah. uh, artists. Uh, uh, the the least known are probably musicians, but there are some some musicians as well. But uh, they've been here in in numbers, you know, with a critical mass for a short period of time, while Filipinos have been here for at least four generations, five generations, just in the 20th century. 
Okay. Yeah. And so we get some recognition, but it's less as doctors and more for nurses, which is obvious, you know, why. Um, and, uh, and less for uh, engineers, even though there's huge numbers, right, of Filipinos guess, yeah. who migrated as engineers. And, yeah. you know, they were working at Bechtel and Fairchild and all those places and down the peninsula at HP and everywhere else. Well, we don't speak out. We don't... Uh... Which, which, you know, created the opening for me to be a member of the loudmouth generation. Um, but, <laughs> yep. But well, yeah, we we. But see, I don't know. We didn't push our own stuff. That's true. But um, I don't know that. You know, the, I think that the the reason the South Asians, or particularly the Indians, got a lot of notice early, is one. Uh, they have a real broad high achievement rate. In other words, they got high achievement across the board, right? Yeah. yeah. And 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 who remember when? Um, I think it was the Progress before it. it the, the, that family bought uh, the Examiner. <clears throat> the Fang family bought the Fangs, yeah. and uh, <clears throat> they had a in April and May they'd have a center section with scholarship winners from high schools yeah, and, you know, on two pages. Right. Okay. And, yeah. and I started laughing like crazy in, in the late seventies, early eighties. And this is before. So, you know, the South Asians were, were arriving, but they weren't in huge numbers. Yeah. Okay. But the Vietnamese, you know, had come post 75, that, sh that short period of immediately after the fall of Saigon, what used to be Saigon. And then the so-called boat people arriving in the early 80s, right? And they were taking over, right? <laughs> they were winning all kinds of scholarships. And it was like I, I would open that up and start laughing, right? Because there were very few white people, yeah. right? A couple of, a couple of uh, Latinos and Chicanos here or there, uh, a couple of African Americans. Everything else was Asians. Right? And, um, and look, this is how we met. We met because we were uh, we won some scholarship. Yeah, there. that kind of stuff. Yeah, back in the seventies. Right. Well, I was I was in college by the seventies, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think you got a college thing. I, I was uh, just stuck in preschool. Well, you were at Lowell. We had a good relationship with Lowell. I probably ran into you, you know, at least once or twice because we'd be asked to. Uh, uh, do do talks, you know, discussions and stuff like that. Yeah. When when uh, I when did you graduate? What year? Seventy. Uh, Seventy three. Okay, yeah. Now that was before a lot of the people got back from Nam, but but several of us of the strike generation yeah. uh, graduated, and they went into the service because they had been ROTC. Oh yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and ROTC was very big. ROTC is very big, especially at Lowell. Lowell. Yeah, yeah, man. Very big at Lowell. It was it was the the competition was always Lowell Balboa and Galileo right they yeah. you know, they'd be competing on it. The Asians think, like their guns. We like fake guns. <laughs> we like our guns. <laughs> yeah, they had those fake little. They, they, there was a period where they actually had the old M ones, right? But yeah. well, they, those guys yeah. were really good at flipping them. And... Oh yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah look, well, look, that, that was also a, that was also an underhanded joke, right? Yeah. No, no, that was not a joke. That was not. A joke. <laughs> now, Dan, we have gone uh, two hours, man. <laughs> record, because we went longer when we did our museum shows. But I, I think we must. Uh, we, we, we celebrate. You, you might have to chop this one up. Yeah. No, no, no. We're, we're just. Gonna, I'm just going to give it to people. Uh, I just want to celebrate the fact that. Well, we should wait. Um, we're six minutes away from New Year's. In yeah. Dublin, okay. In New Year's in Edinburgh. You know, that's okay. one of my secret things. Here is my New Year's resolution. So warm beer, warm beer in Dublin. No, no, no. Here, here, scotch, here, scotch in Edinburgh. Here, yeah. Here's the thing, Dan. We started <laughs> when we started the show. We celebrated New Year's Eve in Tel Aviv, and we just took it all across the the time zones. We are now celebrating in six minutes New Year's Eve in five minutes New Year's Eve in Edinburgh. And of, of course, I say Edinburgh because one of my great Christmas gifts was a chanter. You know what a chanter is? Mm -hmm, I do. You do yeah. know a, ch a yeah. chanter? A chanter is like a, a Scottish kazoo. Yeah. It sounds like this, and it helps you. 
to before you invest in a set of bagpipes. <laughs> it allows you to see, do I want to invest in bagpipes? Yeah, yeah, this kind of yeah. wild hair. You can I, actually I, imitate it, yeah, quite, quite well. With so, no, I, so I was watching something and I said, you know, for my a third act, wouldn't it be great if I just hired myself out as the Filipino bag? And you did the chanter and you used the chanter? No, no, no. Not that. I'm going to have, I'm going to wear a kilt. I'm going to have the Filipino tartan. I'm going to, you know, we're going to go out with, I'll hire myself out to do. Don't you think a Filipino funeral would love some bagpipes? Some pipes. I don't know yeah. any funerals except Scottish funerals and I maybe some Irish funerals that love bagpipes. They, yeah. they, the Filipinos would love a Filipino bagpipe. Right? I think if you told them that it's a it's a goat's that that the bag is 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 goat stomach, you know, it's yeah. made out of goat. This is from the, they, they the, the trunk. You know, the, the, the bing, ang, ang bing, uh. <laughs> I think they I think they like, dig that part. So so th that's the point. So uh, a Filipino bagpiper, I'm going to hire myself out. I'm only know I only know one song. Oh. Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace. That's oh, it. oh, it's and, not oh, oh, Danny Boy, huh? No, 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 that's wrong country. <laughs> yeah, no, that's and, Irish. And, that's Irish. And there may be um, a Filipino version of Scotland the Brave. Okay. And then, you know, those are the two songs. That's it. Filipino, okay. Scot Scotland the Brave and. Um, and, and amazing great. I, I, I like it. I like the thing I like about the bagpipe is when they can have that the drone sound uh, monotone and then play over that. So it oh, sounds yeah, like yeah, two instruments. Oh, that is so cool. That you is, got the bass really going, cool. the bass, yeah. you got the, the yeah. melody. Yep. And now we got, uh, we, we have, Dan, uh, we have like two minutes Ooh. or three minutes before it's uh, a Dublin. Speech. Dublin Ed or Edinburgh? Ed Edinburgh. We got to go Edinburgh. Okay. Okay. Edinburgh. My, my, my father in law is Scottish and uh, he passed away. We have his ashes. We're going to spread his ashes in Edinburgh. At some really? Point. Yeah. At okay. some point, yeah, COVID willing, we're going to spread the ashes in Edinburgh. Yeah. And I don't think why, people, do you think people appreciate how much Scots have given to the world? You know, I mean, Single malt and blended. <laughs> no, I, I far, Scott, beyond Scott, beyond liquor, beyond the liquor. Scots, they've given like, well, how about in in America? Just in America? Yeah, yeah. Bluegrass. Yeah, uh, yeah. Com, comes from you know Scott, you know the Scots, and you know, came to Kentucky and came through right. you know that whole area yep. and whiskey. Whiskey. I I just think I I think it's under underappreciated. I think a lot of people don't understand. You know the Scottish role, or Scotland, Ireland, UK. Uh, there's, well, there's there was still the some dark people. side. There's the dark side too, though. Slavery. Yes. There's still some people who believe <laughs> that the the Scots want to be free. Right, right. That they're well, rebels at heart. <laughs> I mean, thanks, thanks to Mel Gibson, right here. Uh, anyway. But uh, listen, uh, isn't it time? Yeah, no, it's. I have eleven fifty-eight. Oh, okay. In Edinburgh, that's Count a long. Down. That's a long two minutes. What do you got? Two. Oh no, no, I got it. I have to go get something to put in my glass. I I emptied it. I oh no, it no, no, well the air. You do an okay, air. Okay, I'll just air, we'll air. do an air toast. Okay, here it is. Uh, it's eleven fifty nine, and uh, and like I said, it's it's going to be uh, New Year's Eve in London, Dublin, and in Edinburgh, uh, shortly. And so we we lift up a toast to our. Uh, our I, well, I am wearing a Scottish heather uh, sweater. Oh, so very nice, very kinda nice. Kind of cool. That's kind of nice. cool. Uh, we, we, it was just totally incidental. We wish you a happy new year. Happy new year. Manigong ba on taon. That, that's uh, Scottish Filipino. That's right. Uh, Manigong ba on almost, taon. Almost there, 1159. I don't have the, the second hand. Um, so when it turns into 12, it's Happy New Year, and the ball drops. Right. The gong drops. No, the gong doesn't drop. The no, you didn't. Drops. It'll crack. It's you... now. It's Happy New Year. Happy. In, uh, happy. In Edinburgh, yeah. Edinburgh yeah. London, and Dublin. We have now gone several time zones in the Emil Amux Takeout 2022 edition. I think 2022 is going to be a good year. You got all those twos in there, two two oh two two. 
chip twos, a good poker hand, beats an average average trip hand. Trip twos, yeah. Trip twos is okay. Trip twos, okay. I mean, full, full boat, full boat with a high uh, high pair. Uh, that would be even better. But you know, it, it could. It's the basis of something good, but it beats an average hand. Yeah, so it's, it's going to be lucky. So happy New Year if you're in Dublin, London, Edinburgh. Uh, we have gone through several time zones. And read my column on the ALDEF blog, Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. I talk about how we must, you know, hey, be your own New Year's baby this year. <laughs> be, be your own New Year's baby. Baby, baby, baby. Okay. So, Dan, uh, so I'll say goodbye. I'll toast to you. Dan Gonzalez, always a pleasure. And back to you. Thanks for having me on. Uh, always a pleasure to have you on the show because, yes. you know, I can we can talk about the news. We can talk about things. And um, and thank you for chiming in on my Olympia 55. Yeah, yeah. that's a great idea. Yeah, we're going to have Olympia yeah. 55, my mother's recipe, Olympia 55. So we have to do, We I have to dedicate some strike, SF State strike Olympia. Ah, uh, either 68 or 69, right? Yeah. It's yeah. got to be, be pretty We're going to call it SF State. Well, Linda and I make a special Olympia. It, it's like everybody else's, you know, with uh, uh, with uh, uh, light, uh, what do you call it? Uh, clear clear rice, right? Ah, yeah. So, clear, yeah. yeah. All right. Be right. one, right? So be let's. I, we we shall we shall uh, connect but, again. But we put black we put black mushroom in it. We cheat. Oh, black we put oh. yeah. We put oh. we slice up black mushroom as well. So you you could put shrimp and chicken and pork in there with with your with your rice. Yeah, you know your bihon. I gotta go vegan. I gotta go vegan. Yeah. Go. Well, that you yeah, that's bihon. To tofu. Garbanzo. Tofu. Garbanzo. Yeah, you could put garbanzo in it. It's like tofu. Right? Yeah. You can put tofu. Yeah. yeah. You could put oh. that fake tofu fish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. That's yeah, good. that's that's so, that's pretty good. So, Dan, happy New Year to you. All right. Uh, I know you still ha you still have uh, um, you know West Coast New Year and American yeah. New Year. We're not quite New Year's Eve in New York, no. on the East Coast. But okay. uh, yeah, thank you for there. being part of Emil Muck's takeout. Okay, and, thank you, sir. As always, and, and uh, uh, say hi to see Linda. You. Yeah, there it is. Dan Gonzalez, San Francisco State, College of Ethnic Studies. He took part in, we had, we celebrated New Year's in Tel Aviv, Dublin, Edinburgh, and in London on this show. And Happy New Year to all the regular listeners, Juanita to Nicholas, happy, Nicholas in Taipei, where it's already New Year's. It's already New Year's in Taipei. Happy New Year to Nicholas. Um, we uh, are doing this show because this is what we do. But we, we uncovered some things. And if you go to my um, Emil Amux takeout, let me put down my, my drink. It's just coffee and saffron. It really is. Uh, you, you know that, go to my Aldef blog where I say, I say it is time to... Uh, Time to, to to ring in 2022, DYI, be your own New Year's baby. Be your own New Year's rebirth. 2021. I don't want to say it was terrible, but it was a tough, 2021 is a tough, we we're waiting for it to end. And we we're waiting for it to end because we thought, ah, it's too much like 2020. It's still, it's dragging on. And it now with Omicron, it's going to drag on. We need, uh, we need to come to 2022 with our empty hands. Fresh face. Just like a baby. Let's forget it. Forget the baggage of the past. And try to move forward with a sense of grace and a cough. No, not Omicron. Not Omicron. Anyway, um, so we've 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 gone over two hours. Time to say goodbye. 
And if New Year's hasn't happened yet, where you are, I, I, I wish you nothing but a blessed and safe and, and happy New Year. I'm just staying here. I'm, I'm staying put because it's a safe way. And, but if you choose to go out, is, is your right. I hope, I hope you're safe. I hope you're safe. So, you know, this is, like I said, one of our longer shows. But, you know, if you get this far, this is where you get the, the loving kindness, the self-compassion. You belong. Thank you for being here. There's no shame. Only love. You know, as I'm fond of saying at this point, as I wish for me, I wish for you. May you be safe. May you be happy. May you be healthy. And may you live with ease. Happy New Year, everyone. Till next time. Emil Guillermo here. Mahal Kitab.